a security of lives and properties. That is number one. And there has been a massive failure when it comes to security of lives and properties. How do we go back and face our people in the face of so much mayhem where life has become worthless? And then we talk about these things every day in the National Assembly. I cannot remember how many bills and motions that we have moved on security alone. And every day is the same thing. I think the time has come as a legislator. I think the time has come for the National Assembly to go on a retreat to look at legislative solutions that can translate to security on ground. I think we have porous borders. I think that we, 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 our prison systems are not correct. A situation where you take hardcore terrorists and you put them in jail with normal people, that, people have, that have uh, stolen goats and cows, like you had Boko Haram uh, terrorists being sequestered in Ekulobia prisons in, uh, in Anambra state. What do you think would happen? Of course, radicalization will happen within the prison confines. And people who have gone in normal will come out with uh, you know, radicalized ideas and all of that. So we need an integrated approach to security. It's not enough for us as government to come out to condemn uh, the, uh, the bombing attack on Christmas Day and then we move on with the celebration of Christmas. That is not right. We need to sit with the security chiefs. As far as I'm concerned, the security apparatus in Nigeria is disconnected. We have gone beyond boots on ground, hard core security to soft, intelligent security, where you infiltrate and you get information and you use that information to prevent as against going to on an inspection of a devastated area. We need to become preventative in our approach and it takes more than just ordering hardware and putting more boots on ground to intelligence. That is where it is globally today. And in all of these areas, I think we're not doing well as a people and definitely the government has a lot of questions to answer. Now, uh, your party has been particularly affected by the other plank, which is the war against corruption. And part of the argument is that, well, your party was in power for 16 years prior to 2015. So definitely, if there were people to be accused of corruption, there would be a preponderance in that party. But are you one of those who would believe that, in spite of that logic, the war has been selective and possibly designed to hound political opponents as opposed to designed to tackle corruption? I definitely think that the war is skewed against, uh, obviously, the party for political reasons. I think that there has been selective witch hunting going on in Nigeria. And I think that it is also being uh, targeted specifically to curry uh, political favors. Sometimes it, it really, it's really painful to see the way that these informations are released. And I'll give you an example. The day that we had a Boko Haram explosion in Meduguri where 40 people were killed on the news. The very next item on the news was where the vice president was releasing names of uh, corrupt uh, looters. looters from alleged, previous, looters. alleged looters from the previous... Uh, and, and there was this news where 40 people had just been murdered. And, of course, in every Nigerian home, watching that news, there was, it was a somber and very reflective moment where you say, oh my God, what are we going to do? And the next a news item was the vice president was somewhere releasing names of alleged looters. And so you see the priority and the focus of the government. No wonder we're not doing so well in terms of uh, security. But specifically speaking to the issue of corruption, I think it's a people problem. I think that if the APC was to be in power, for the next 16 years, we will see the same problems. I think it goes beyond, after all, who are the so-called people in APC today? They are all PDP people. And so I think we need to look at the people, the pot. What breeds corruption? I think if you have any system, be it in the West, even in America today or in the UK, if you have a system where you have executive powers that are unchecked with no internal controls, they will be subject to abuse. And I think we need to now 
look at the processes, look at the institutions, strengthen them so that the punishment will be a deterrent. Even in corporate governance in Nigeria today, you see people that have infractions on perhaps the environment. And when they look at the penal code or the, the penalty, it's 100 naira. And so they would rather break the law and pay the, you know, no, 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 and that's what I think we need to look at. We need to stop looking at corruption as a PDP or APC problem. Otherwise, we will not scratch it. But as a people problem, the people of Nigeria are perceived to be corrupt, regardless of the brilliance that we have and the straightforward and upright people that we have today. It's a systemic thing. We need to look at the civil service. We need to look at the politicians. We need to look at the law enforcement and the judiciary and see how we can bring it all in to fight the corruption and not going after people and then blowing whistles and then not getting paid for whatever it is that we're blowing the whistles for. Now, uh, the final plank was the economy. And that's the one that seems to affect the most people. You see, you, uh, from what I have gathered in speaking to a number of people, uh, the war against corruption can be on some people, but it doesn't percolate down to those who are at the mass level. The insecurity matter affects them definitely, but the bread and butter issues, where do you sleep, what do you eat, how do you work, and all of that, are the ones that touch. And that's why elected leaders are elected. Have they fared any better than in the first two? Well, I'm sure every Nigerian knows the answer to that question. But just so that you know, I believe the woes or the economic, uh, the, the, the woes or the problems that we have in the economy that manifested was brought to fore when Nigeria's economy slipped into uh, recession. recession. And of course, we all know that when your, you know, your, your economy contracts for two consecutive, uh, you know, you go into, but I think that way before that time, we're already heading to where we are today. In fact, I make bold to say that when we're going around parading as the largest economy in Africa, we were already heading in this direction. But because of the buffer of the oil price, nobody noticed. It only took certain economists in our, in our time to start sending early warning, warning signals, signals, which we don't have. What I would have expected now is that we will definitely turn the tide. The country is too big to fail. The way we are, just like the, the flywheel effect. So it's difficult to get rolling. But when the once wheels start, once you start, you know, you can't stop. So Nigeria as an economy is too big to fail. What did we do to become the largest economy? We activated some of the soft areas, Nollywood, Telecom, and all of those now counted, and we became the largest economy in, in, in Africa. But we didn't manage all of this because of planning, saving for the rainy day, and all of that. I think that I have not seen a concerted effort. I am not comfortable with the president's economic team. I do not think that they have demonstrated enough capacity to make projections to say by 2000, and you remember the vision 2020, 20. 2020. To, we are now in 2018. We thought that 2020 would never come. And today the MDGs have morphed to become the SDGs. And we're going to push the targets and all of that. We need specific, timely, measurable, and time-bound objectives and goals. If we are serious, by this time next year, we should be able to say, this is where our economy would be, and these are the steps that we're going to take, and we will measure, not just the executive, but all the stakeholders, including the National Assembly. We have the relevant committees. We have the Committee on Appropriation, on Finance, on Budget, on Debts and Foreign. We have all of that resource that we can come together but we don't interface until perhaps when it's too late. So there is real need for a global matrix or a national matrix of information exchange on the economy so that we don't go to business forums or the economic summit groups and conferences and look at these figures and they mean nothing to us. We can't let the economy be an accident. We cannot allow the economy to just happen to us. 
we should take concrete steps that will influence the economy. If I was the governor today of my state, for instance, the first thing I would do is call everybody to the table and say, look, what do we have? What do we need? And what do we want? And then together, we will work out these things. If we needed to fire or reduce the overhead, we will take those decisions together with the people and they will be carried along and be happy to make those sacrifices knowing that the economy or the, the lives of their children will be impacted positively. That's the kind of intervention that I don't see when we discuss the economy. People just come out and, you know, bash and say all manners of things without proffering solutions that we may not see the results today, but the results will certainly come and Nigerians that will come after us will benefit from them. Uh, you, you, you said something earlier just now. You said, if you were the governor, are you planning to contest the governorship next year? No, thank you. Are you planning to run for a second term in the, in the National Assembly? I think that as a federal constituency, it is better to return your legislators and your senators. I think the situation where we send first-timers every term is actually not good for the federal constituency. I think as you become ranking in the legislature or in the assembly, you, you have a lot of experience, you have a lot of contacts, a lot of connections uh, that you can bring to bear on the work and obviously reflect on your constituents. I think that just like in the United States where you see legislators who have been part of Congress for 30 years, 40 years, a lifetime, as long as you're doing well, I think that you should be given the chance to go back. I think it's a learning process, but I think that it's one that is best for the people when you, know, you return your, your representatives. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, as I said, it's seen as a turn by turn. You, your side of the town has the gone, have gone, and this time, and of course, regardless of the potential, you cannot become a, a presiding officer. In the night, it's difficult without being ranking, except there's some accident that has happened. The stronger you are, it's better for the institution. You carry with you institutional memory, and there's some things that will be brought to the floor. And because you've been part of previous assemblies, you can make a contribution and draw inferences from how it was handled in the past, plus all the other things that you can bring to your constituents. So, based on all of these, I think that uh, I have. I would definitely be putting myself forward. Forward, to, forward. Yes. All right, then. Honorable Mamuba, good luck with that, and thank you for speaking with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.